Welcome everybody to uh, our webinar today. Uh, the topic is how can we increase carbon stocks in deep soil? And as folks are filing into the webinar, I just wanna say that this is the sixth installment of a series titled Critical Questions in Soil Carbon Sequestration. My name is Claire Phillips. I'm a research soil scientist with the USDA ARS and I am your host for today. And together with several colleagues, we've organized this webinar series um, with the International Soil Carbon Network. And so I'll just mention briefly that the ISCN is an inclusive community of folks that want to do uh, networked soil carbon science. And you are welcome to join um, our mailing list through the ISCN website and I'll also post the link to that in the chat here. Um, and um, today we are focused on the question, some related questions of deep soil carbon, how it has been affected by human impacts with changes in vegetation type, and um, looking forward how we might alter and build soil carbon stocks through the vegetation types that we have on the landscape and through crop selections and crop breeding. Um, this is really a frontier area of research and many of the questions that you all posed in the registration survey were very provocative. <laughs> and um, and we'll, we'll take some time, I believe, to have answers to those questions. So I feel really fortunate today that we have two speakers that are at the leading edge of this frontier topic. And our first speaker today is Professor Sharon Billings from University of Kansas. She's an ecologist and biogeochemist, and she is sharing work from the Calhoun Experimental Forest, which has very deep soils that she has studied, as well as other locations. And so I'm going to pass the pass the torch over to her, and I um, invite you to give her your full attention. And please ask questions as they come up in your GoToWebinar panel. You will see a questions part of that, and please type in your questions. The talks are 20 minutes, and we'll have about seven minutes for questions between each speaker. After Sharon, we're gonna have Dr. Larry York, who's a root physiologist and has been developing techniques for root phenotyping. And he will talk to us about the possibilities for breeding crops for deep rootedness. So our, uh, thank you, Sharon, our first speaker. I will turn off my video and let you take it from here. Thanks. Can everyone see my screen? Is that set right now, Claire? It is, yep, it Thanks. looks good. Okay, thanks so much for that introduction and the invitation to do this. This is a very different kind of um, seminar for me to give. Instead of focusing on our own lab's work, um, instead, I thought that it would be important to kind of bring together information from some diverse disciplines in the literature to try to appeal to what I think is a pretty diverse set of stakeholders in the audience to share where different disciplines and sub-disciplines within those have come to um, right now, with, still the jury is out, but where what we are thinking now about deep roots as drivers of deep SOC dynamics. And of course, I want to appreciate um, the funding agencies that keep our labs afloat and many colleagues. I wanna acknowledge that um, I'm standing on the shoulders, we all are standing on the shoulders of giants in the literature many of whom um, have generated a lot of wonderful papers that in the interest of time, I, I can't cite them all in this, in this talk, but I also have a set of really close collaborators in and outside of my lab that I wanna acknowledge who influence my thoughts. So the role of deep roots as drivers of SOC dynamics is a big puzzle. For decades, um, people have wondered about how deeply vegetation roots, and this is probably the seminal paper on tree roots maximum extent of rooting done by Earl Stone and Calise here in 1991. And they kind of set the bar very high for um, collating a lot of data demonstrating just how deeply plants can root 
linked to that, and more recently, people have really functioned, uh, have really focused on what is the actual functioning of those really deep roots. Um, and uh, Jean-Luc May has these really ni a really nice set of papers trying to demonstrate that understanding what deep roots are doing um, very deep in the regolith is really important for understanding whole ecosystem functioning, not just related to SOC. And recently, Sharon, I'm um, sorry, I, I need to pop in because your slides aren't advancing. So uh -oh. um, yeah, so maybe come out of presenter mode. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Um, it looks like your screen is frozen. It's still on that first title slide. So I'm going to just toggle off the sharing and then have you share again. We'll try that. Okay. Okay, can people good. see that? Yeah, can you try okay. toggling backwards yeah. or forwards? Okay, that it good? seems to be working, yeah. Great, okay. So um, now I have to talk faster. That's gonna be hard. All right, so um, this, this paper kind of set the bar for collating a lot of data from a lot of data sets going all over the world to try to understand just how deeply vegetation can root can root, and more recently, people have really started focusing on what those roots are doing. The, the, what the perspective on what roots are doing differs across disciplines, and that's one of the points that I wanna make in this talk, is that whether you talk to a pedologist or a hydrologist or a microbial ecologist, we all have very different perspectives on the importance of roots, even as it links to SOC. Now, um, in recent years, there has been a lot of focus or um, certainly um, quite a bit of publicity about things like um, perennial crops. So we know that roots tend to grow more deeply where plants persist for a long time. And um, because we manage most of Earth's ecosystems directly or indirectly, it's really where, where we allow plants to persist for a long time. So we see this at the individual scale from, from a pretty famous photograph now from the Land Institute where they're demonstrating the difference in below ground carbon investment of annual crops like wheat, winter wheat here, versus um, Kernza, wheatgrass, that um, has is a perennial crop and therefore has a very long time to invest carbon below ground into some pretty massive rooting systems. So we see this at the individual plant scale, we see it at the crop um, plot scale. So here is a paper from 2020 where they're demonstrating that if you plant annual crops year after year, you get some root biomass that actually goes down quite impressively for one growing season. But some of those crops invest significantly below two meters. So that's the bright green. And when you, in, um, when you plant perennial crops like wheatgrass or the Land Institute's Kernza, you can see that that investment in the bright green below two meters is, is really, um, really significant. We also see the influence of changing roots in the Anthropocene at the regional and global scale. So we know that humans are really good at taking out perennial systems and putting in annual agricultural crops. And we see that reflected in this plot. Um, this is not plotting rooting depths, it is plotting the change in rooting depths. And every place where it is red, it is a projection at the global or, and, and regional scale within regions of where roots have become shallower primarily due to human land use. So we know that humans are changing um, the depths to which roots, roots extend. We also know, and these are the data from the Calhoun that I think that Claire might have been referring to, we know from um, not just the Calhoun, but lots of different places, that it takes a really long time to regenerate roots. So what you're looking at here is depth on the Y. So as you go down the Y axis, you're getting down to two meters in, in the plot. And on the X, we've plotted a, one metric of rooting abundance. And you can see in the orange points, those are from agricultural fields, that there's much lower rooting abundances than especially the green point, points. And those green points come from old growth hardwood forests that have been there for centuries. 
In the middle are plotted yellow triangles, and those reflect regenerating forests that are about 75 to 80 years old. And so our point here is that humans are really good at removing perennial systems and installing annual, frequently intensively disturbed systems that kill plants and therefore um, kill deep roots. And it takes a really long time to get them back. And we see this again and again in multiple studies. So here's um, a study from 2015 looking at forest stand age and um, how it links to fine root production. And the, as basal area increases across stand age, what fine root biomass does, right? It increases across time. So those are some, those are some really important um, knowledge bases on which we can, we can base the rest of this talk. So our operational question assigned to me was, I've rephrased it, but can root activities down deep be counted on to augment SOC stocks? So we can look to Jabagi and Jackson's now famous work from 21 years ago now, where they did a global analysis of soil organic carbon as you go down in depth, and they link it to rooting abundances as you go down in depth. Now it might be tempting to make a correlation between SOC and roots. And these two plots side by side are really strong evidence that you'd get a positive relationship and it would be probably a pretty nice fit, but it would be very misleading because we don't know if this organic carbon actually is derived from roots. We, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit um, more, but we don't know the extent to which it's derived from roots versus material infiltrating or percolating down through the soil profile from litter fall above ground or lateral flow. And we also don't know of this pool, how persistent it has been and how persistent it will be. So there are a lot of questions left um, to uncover. And to, to do that, we really have to get into some of the mechanisms and think about what roots do. So we know that roots take up water. That's probably their most famous trait. It's questionable whether really deep roots are really important for deep water uptake. We know they're not important for very much water uptake. They might be important for um, periodically critical water uptake, like during a drought. But this really nice paper came out a few years ago looking at the maximum depth of water uptake. And it's clear from the red and orange areas that some of the places where roots are taking water up, it's very deep. And I bring this up not as an ecohydrologist, but rather to indicate the importance of water uptake as it relates to SOC dynamics deep in the profile. And to understand that linkage, you need to understand the very basics of how soil can be structured. So soil is com composed of many, many macro and micro aggregates, and aggregates are clusters of mineral and um, uh, soil minerals mixed with organic matter in many, many different forms. And those aggregates are viewed as very important for offering cr um, physical protection for organic carbon. So organic carbon that is inside the aggregate is subjected to much, many fewer opportunities for microbes to attack it and mineralize it. So we know that aggregates are this important component of how, how soils can actually physically protect the organic carbon that they harbor. And, and the linkage to water uptake is that every time a root takes up water, it's drying out the soil around it. And soil undergoes these constant wet dry cycles and the frequency and intensity of those cycles is linked to aggregate stability not in all, but in many soils, frequency and intensity of wet dry cycles is linked to enhanced aggregate stability. So protection of that soil organic carbon. So that, that water uptake is important. But what else do roots do that is relevant to SOC, especially down deep? Well, we know from Luke McCormick's work and others um, on um, working with him that roots of different sizes emphasized in this slide, but also different locations in the branching structure. And that's something that Larry knows um, a lot more about than I do. We know that roots functionality changes according to size and place in that, in that branching structure. We also know that roots make exudates. So their contributions to carbon certainly are their actual growth. They indirectly influence carbon by those wet dry cycles, but they also add to carbon by generating exudates. So roots generate exudates that can provide for plant defense. They also generate exudates in a fascinating depth dependent way to acquire nutrients. 
So um, this is a, a conceptual slide from a graduate student in my lab, Emma Hauser, and she demonstrated this depth dependent way in which forest trees exude carbon that's very expensive. They exude exoenzymes that are very high in carbon concentration to obtain organic nutrients. Here it's phosphorus. And in so doing, they induce the decay of organic matter, which allows microbes to really access the carbon and generate CO2, losing SOC. As we head deeper into the profile though, plant strategies for nutrient acquisition seem to change. And some plants rely entirely or certainly dominantly on much more inexpensive in terms of carbon exo, um, exudates like organic acids that allow them to access phosphorus sources that are locked up in minerals. And some forests have both strategies. So the point here is that depending on the exudates, not only are they adding carbon to the, to the soil in a way that might become stabilized, something we'll talk about in a minute, but whatever those exudates are, has different probabilities for promoting SOC loss through microbial actions. We see this in, in um, beautiful living color using some of the amazing imagery technology we have now, looking, for example, at mucilages of root exudates and the microbial populations that surround roots. And you can see the influence of this in the right-hand panel as you move away from the root as, so we're getting further and further away from the root here. The, the carbon concentration is going down because root exudates, the concentration of those is declining as we move out across space. And also as we move out across space away from the root, the nutrient concentration goes up because near the root, that the root is um, using active transport to, in most instances anyway, to obtain that, car, that um, nutrient source. So roots add carbon to soil, not just through their growth, but via exudates. And the kind of exudates dictate the fate of that exudate and um, how much CO2 can be released from SOC. We also know that roots are hotspots for microbial activity. So you can't ask a question about root contributions to SOC without also considering the microbes that they nurture. And we know from um, lots of studies, this is a recent one that has this fantastic graphic that's demonstrating how around mineral material and around roots, there, there's this clustering of, of uh, soil microbes. And those microbes are important for multiple reasons. One of the reasons is because as we move down through the soil profile into deeper depths, so here we're getting down into more than 100 centimeters for some of these plots, we see that the fraction of SOC that is composed of microbial necromass, so dead microbes, either um, declines in croplands or stays the same as at the surface. And that is a really powerful comment on the power of microbial necromass or dead microbes to stick around because we know that down deep, microbial communities are really low in abundance relative to up near the surface. But even down deep where microbes are harder to come by, there's this significant compositional effect on SOC. So microbial necromass seems to be a key component of well-preserved SOC. And that's important also because that necromass seems to be really sticky. So sticky is a word that actually has started to crop up in the scientific literature. It's sometimes put in quotes, but what we mean by it is that it not only sticks around, but it seems to actually promote aggregation. And so we refer to many carbon compounds in the soil as binding agents. And some of those binding agents, a lot of them seem to actually be derived from dead microbes. And that's really important because of all the aforementioned physical protection that aggregates can promote. So that, that's one part of this story, that dead microbes comprise a big part of SOC, especially down deep. And that's a really quite dramatic effect relative to the decline in microbial biomass as you head down. But in spite of the fact that these exudates, they help, they seem to stick around for a while, they help to form aggregates. But unfortunately, in terms of SOC accrual and maintenance, microbes also, of course, mineralize SOC. So heterotrophic microbes who have SOC at their disposal and have sufficient oxygen with which they can actually respire, um, they will, given the opportunity, mineralize that SOC and use it to build their biomass and to generate um, CO2, so losing that SOC. And Wei Jing Cheng has been um, um, one of the 
people at the forefront of the, what's called the rhizosphere priming effect. And what his work and many others has uncovered is that if you offer carbon to soil microbes, even microbes down deep, they will bloom. Their populations will experience a bloom. They will grow on that carbon. But once the source is, once that initial source of carbon is exhausted, they have no choice but to turn to the extant carbon around them. And that, that's what's called the priming effect, that you can add a little bit of carbon to a deep soil. And as a result of that car little tiny carbon addition, you have a, a net loss of SOC because the microbial communities have to turn to the existing carbon as a source for mineralization. And this meta-analysis that just recently came out of um, just a handful of years ago is demonstrating across all kinds of plant types and multiple soil textures, we seem to always have an effect size of this priming effect that's greater than the zero line. So it's a, it's a meaningful effect in, in most systems. Trying to make sense of all this is very challenging. If you're feeling confused about the pros and cons of root effects on SOC, Con contributing to SOC, but also detracting from it, you are not alone. And in an effort to help clarify um, the processes that we know about, Dijkstra et al. just came out with this lovely paper in New Phytologist, a Tansley Insight paper, um, so about, just about a year ago now, where they have these beautiful graphics depicting how roots can influence SOC gain and SOC loss. Now, this is not a paper that um, focuses on the deep carbon, but that's what we're going to try to do. And they highlight what they call their rhizo engine. So this is their generic schematic. And they offer a refined schematic for different scenarios. And I've isolated the one where, that I think is most relevant for deep carbon. And here they emphasize that this M gear, the microbial gear, is taking inputs down um, in scenarios, they don't say deep, but similar to what we might find in deep soils, shunting that material into protected pools of carbon. And also, um, this is the priming effect, allowing for CO2 loss, the red arrow coming from unprotected, um, the unprotected realm of SOC. Now, what we do know about, so that's an important contribution, but what we do know down deep, making it most relevant for down deep, is that we can use radiocarbon, a field that is really led, um, has been led for decades now by Sue Trumbor, and we can look at how radiocarbon signatures tell us about how long SOC has sat in deep carbon. And in general, as we go down in depth here, you don't need to worry about the x-axis units, but just know that as we get more negative, we are getting to carbon that has been isolated from the atmosphere on average for a much longer period of time, thousands of years. And that's what this one plot demonstrates. And in this paper, they demonstrated this for many, many biomes. So each number here represents a biome. So we know as we get deeper, SOC tends on average to get older. We have to say that wincing a little bit because there are assumptions that we make, but in general, that seems to be, um, seems to be a truth. And what we also know is, um, I have just one minute here, I think, to wrap up. What we also seem to um, observe is that root carbon seems to be rising to the top in multiple studies as the proportion of SOC that seems to have the greatest persistence. And this is co um, coinciding with a lot of Myrna Simpson's work up in University of Toronto, demonstrating that root chem compounds seem to have greater persistence coinciding with some of what Mark Bradford's lab is also demonstrating. So I've developed this table that I think demonstrates some of, not all, but some of the positive and negative impacts on SOC. And I've organized it by the different processes that I've talked about today. Um, by root respiration, I, I'm just highlighting that I'm talking about the acidification of, of the environment. And um, we probably don't have time to go through all of the different cells, but I think this is gonna be made available online. And, and I think that the net effect of all of these is that of course it's a mixed bag, but on evidence, the, on balance, the, the evidence seems to suggest that deep roots do promote a net SOC accrual and that that material seems to be quite persistent. It's not true everywhere, however. But I want to emphasize one final point, and that is that in spite of what I believe to be true about that statement that I just made with a lot of complicated caveats, that's no substitute for cutting fossil fuel emissions. 
I would never want for this talk or my words to be taken out of context to suggest that I am offering this as a way out of our fossil fuel addiction. Um, that is that that is something that I think our society more broadly needs to address and 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 promoting the growth of deep roots into many in many different ecosystems, for example, trying to preserve primary forests, I think can be an important wedge towards um, cutting CO2 concentrations and helping to keep CO2 locked up in soil, but it is really no substitute for what I think really has to happen, which is cutting those fossil fuel emissions. So with that, I will end and um, say thank you. And I think that we have some, Claire said we have some minutes here to go with uh, some Q and A. Thank you, Sharon. And I'm just, I'm giggling because I appreciate how you dove into this complicated topic feet first, and you just brought it all in, all in the complications for us and put it all in, in, in the bag, in that table. And, um, and that's good because uh, I think folks will rise to the challenge of embracing all these complications about the fact that roots can have um, positive or uh, a, can be an input, can also be a, a source of priming um, and that there, it's a complicated issue. Um, I'm going to take a couple questions that people have posed in the chat. Okay, um, could I stop sharing my screen so that um, I can see folks? Yeah, yeah. That would be cool. Thanks. And um, I just want to tell folks too, we will post this video afterwards and I know that I'll have to go through and listen <laughs> to your talk again. That had a lot of content. Um, so one question is, while root exudate carbon is obviously important, perhaps disproportionately in terms of rhizosphere processes, what do we know about the amount of exudate carbon that is transferred to the soil on an annual basis across biome types? Oh, I think the short answer to that is not much. So there are some people who have measured actual rates of root exudation under different conditions. So for example, Rich Phillips lab, University of Illinois, um, he does a lot of excellent work looking at different environmental conditions and then quantifiably measuring root exudate rates. So, so that technology exists and looking at the chemical composition of those exudates, right? That's pretty amazing that we can do that. Um, but I think the person asking the question is trying to get at, so, so how do those rates compare across biome? And, and the answer is, we just don't know. We just don't know. <clears throat> we, in my own lab, we have looked at the functionality of exudates as you go down, um, down a soil profile deep into the regolith across different ecosystem types, very different from biome types, right? Um, and we have made inferences about what those exudates are, but it's really difficult to find studies that are both calculating the rate or estimating the rate and then looking at the ecosystem scale consequences of that. Um, Rich Phillips is the one who is really measuring those, the rates, I'm sure there's others too, but he's, he's the one whose work I'm most familiar with. He's, he's looked at it a lot under high CO2 and control conditions. Mm -hmm. um, years ago. That's where I think he really refined the approaches for understanding root exudate rates. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm gonna, um, your, your talk focused a lot on the pools and the fluxes of carbon within say a given depth interval. And one of the questions that was posed in the registration questionnaire is, what are the connection mechanisms between um, the shallow soil layers and the deeper soil layers? And I think um, explicitly, if you can tie roots into that, how roots are creating those connections, that would be helpful. Yeah. So in a in a recent um, thing that I wrote, 
I guess it, I guess it was a chapter. I, I actually used the word perforate. And I think that verb might be important for this, for um, developing an answer to this question. At a very coarse level, we can view roots as um, perforators of Earth's living skin. For them to grow, they need a channel. And they often choose channels that already exist because that's you know easier, right? There's less, there's less counter pressure. But where those channels don't exist and where roots sense a resource that they need and there's no channel, they must grow there. And so the earth would be much less perforated if it weren't for roots. And when roots are able to grow deep enough to reach bedrock, they help to actually perforate bedrock too. And of course the rates at which that happens and so forth, but you know, the conditions under which it's occurring, it all changes depending like on bedrock crystallinity, right? And like the actual mineralogy of the system. Um, but to the extent that roots are perforated, are perforators, sorry, they are the agents that connect the above ground atmosphere and the surface horizons with the deep whatever the deep means. So at the Calhoun, the deep is tens of meters deep. In other systems like recent, recently glaciated systems um, or systems where a lot of erosion is occurring, the um, like on mountainsides, for example, it might be quite shallow, right? Um, so they are the connectors. And through those channels, we have biopores that are formed that often are lined with clay films that help solidify them, help make them more robust and persistent across time. And through those channels, water, nutrients, oxygen, other gases flow. And so in that way, roots really serve as this vital connecting um, link between surface horizons and the deep. They also are signaling above ground environmental conditions to the deep, right? Like, like atmospheric demand for water, that signal is transported via the roots, sometimes quite deep into the system. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I, I completely, but I view roots as these agents that are perforating holes in Earth's living skin, also known as soil. And they, and through those holes, a lot of things flow, gases and liquids. And as a result, roots are agents of connectivity between the surface and the deep. Great, thank you, Sharon. I think that's a really good segue for Larry's talk as he uh, Great. works. He's gonna be talking about imaging those uh, perforations and those networks. And um, let me go ahead and make you the presenter, Larry. Oops, there we go. Mm. That's perfect. All right, thank you. Okay, you you may notice that I actually have changed my title while Sharon was um, speaking <laughs> about roots as perforators. I like that idea. So that's what I'll be speaking about, um, roots as perforators and um, how how deep roots can relate to carbon sequestration. So um, like Sharon just pointed out a lot, um, below ground carbon sequestration um, all involves a very complex system. And I've taken this opportunity um, and I want to thank uh, Claire for inviting us to speak on it. And I, I took this as a chance for me to learn a lot more about these as well. And what I have seen is that sequestration is really an emergent property of a complex system. And a lot of the things that we think, we know that we don't have a full understanding. And it's because it is so complicated. Um, and this, this figure, when, I, when I've taken some example figures from several papers, and I always cite the paper there so you can look it up your, yourself. But one thing that this does show um, is that as you go down deep, deeper in soil, the ages of the carbon are older, as was shown. 
and that there's many routes for carbon to get there, um, both from root litter, like the senest roots, and from root exudates um, and other types of rhizo deposition being a broad term for root inputs. Um, I've taken this paper as maybe the best blueprint in the literature um, if we're thinking about engineering um, crops or other plants, um, that this could <clears throat> potentially be a blueprint for the best root system for storing soil carbon below ground. In this paper, they basically uh, provide evidence for many root traits, um, such as root length density, which is sort of a abundance of roots, morphology metrics like the diameter, specific root length, uh, specific root length is um, the length divided by the mass. So it tells you sort of how long a root can grow for, for the equivalent amount of carbon, um, et cetera. And it's important to me to think about things like the spe specific root length because we're not only thinking about the carbon efficiency of the ecosystem and soil carbon, we also have to think about the carbon efficiency of the plant itself. And so that's really a unifying framework for all of this thinking is carbon efficiency um, from the plant to the entire ecosystem. And so I uh, highly recommend this paper um, as a background. So I came up with some things that I thought of as sort of um, when we're thinking in these areas, there's really a lot of hype and we have to be careful about the hype because I think, um, you know, as, as, as scientists, we don't want to oversell our, our, ourselves and we need to be clear that um, a lot of these things can be, as that one paper Sharon showed, uh, could be a double-edged sword. And one of those is rhizosphere priming, that you could definitely have the unintended consequence that if you um, release new fresh carbon into a deep soil horizon that already has stored carbon, it could very well release that carbon that's stored into the atmosphere and actually have the opposite effect of what we intended. And I liked this um, diagram for being fairly simplistic and showing that the released um, organic compounds basically are going to the um, the microbiome, just, just to speak broadly, which has exoenzymes that can break down um, bound, protected, stabilized carbon that Sharon mentioned, and that this is the carbon that we can have the unattended effect of releasing. So beware of what you wish for. And that carbon is released as CO2. Um, another area that to me is, uh, has a lot of debate and I think, um, frankly, a bit of um, na naivety um, about it is to be or not to be recalcitrant. And this this paper below gives a nice litter-centered approach and soil-centered approach. Now, recal recalcitrant means to be resistant to decomposition. And so, it, of course, it's easy to think, well, yeah, if you had um, root material that was perfectly non-decomposable, then that's great. It'll just stay in the soil, it's protected. But on the other hand, um, when we look um, from a soil-centered approach, that high quality litter that actually has more nitrogen, because bacteria like plants need nitrogen and carbon, this, this high quality uh, root litter um, eventually becomes st stabilized due to the microbial necromass, as we just discussed. And so this is the major thing, like when people are talking about engineering plants now, they're usually talking about recalcitrant materials, but I think we really have to question that. And um, indeed, this has led to some exciting debates in the news um, this, this summer. Um, so this is a really great um, initiative led by several of my colleagues at the Salk Institute. Um, and I have pro profound respect for this um, initiative, and I don't mean to say anything negative about it, because I think that the, the um, investigators in this are also aware of the issues and they're trying to make progress and understanding it further. But just to show the depth of this debate, this was in um, the Atlantic recently as a major climate idea is based on some shaky science. This was in the summer of this year, 
I had to move uh, the, let's see, it still works. Okay, yep. Yeah. So the thing, the quotes in this, such as the theory of a soil organic carbon accumulation that's in the textbook has been proven mostly false and we're still teaching it. Microbes will learn to break anything down. So that's kind of calling into question of even things you think are recalcitrant, maybe they're not really, and for a long enough term to be useful. Um, the literature suggests that subrin will be broken down just like every other organic plant plant com component. So certainly we have a lot of thinking to do here that if we're targeting specific chemical compounds, well, which ones are the best and where do they need to go? Who are they feeding and where do they end up in the long run? Um, it's really, really complicated. As another example, this is a paper that was in, impactful to me where they fertilize grasslands with nitrogen and uh, basically found out that you can store soil organic carbon simply by f fertilizing grasslands. And I'll give the caveat there that the um, carbon emissions associated with the production and transportation and application of that nitrogen is more than the soil carbon that's stored. But still, it's worth to think about that if you have somehow had free nitrogen to spread, that that's potentially a way to um, store it. But then the authors question, how, how is it stored? And it was not, you would normally think it was because of increased root inputs. And that did not seem to be the major factor. But what you see on the right here is the root C to N ratio, which is a measure of quality, where lower C to N ratios means that there's um, um, less carbon and more nitrogen. This is called higher quality and it's better food for the microbes. It matches their um, metabolism better. And in the, in the treatments with added nitrogen, this was lower. And they think that this increased the metabolic efficiency of the microbes and indeed that may lead to less of a priming effect in some sense as well. So in fact, this is evidence going from the opposite of recalcitrants to things that are more decomposable leading to soil carbon accumulation. So indeed, it's not as simple as we might think on first glance. And then last one of the caveats I want to give is too much of a good thing. What happens when soil carbon goes bad? Now, these studies are really interesting to me as a plant phys physiologist, and it started with a meta-analysis um, where they looked at soil orga organic carbon uh, per percent and yield, and they found that generally yield plateaus as soil organic carbon increases. And we believe that yield is promoted by um, some amount of greater soil organic carbon because of um, mostly from, from water, that soil organic carbon can help with water infiltration and water retention. Um, but you can see it plateaus and goes down. And in fact, they followed up with this with a greenhouse ex experiment that's pretty interesting where they directly ma manipulated organic matter. Notice organic matter, I believe, should be about double soil organic carbon because it's not only measuring the carbon but the entire mass of the matter um, and they actually found a neg you know beyond five percent organic matter there starts to started to be a negative effect on plant per performance this was um, wheat i believe um, and the mechanism for this negative um, effect is not known so as a physiologist this is really interesting to me and it makes you think well if we're designing plants to build soil organic carbon could they actually build soil organic carbon to the point that they actually start to inhibit their own growth? And so that would be something that we would have to address um, and possibly just a part of the co-optimization process. So with some of those um, fun caveats, um, th those are some things that I've been thinking a lot about the past year or two. Um, when we start to think about how do we get deep roots, again, there's a lot of, um, naive thinking in this area most, most people always say well you want you want bigger roots of course yeah but let's let's think let's think through that a little bit so which came first the big root or the big shoot let's imagine a little um circle plant model and um even though these are circles i'm more or less assuming that they're squares with a 1.5 um unit um width and height and so the area then is proportional to their mass, say. And so the, the total mass is 4.5. Um, so a lot of people think, oh, we can have the same shoot, but let's just give more to the roots. So I have a bigger root system. And so 
um, this big root system all, all together. Had to move things again to see my own numbers here. Uh, this all together adds up to 6.225. Um, but in reality, what we know about how plants work and the allocation of all plants part, in fact, if you increase the root system to a, a four, say, and your total mass is constrained to be 4.5 because of photosynthesis, well, you could lead yourself into a situation where all of a sudden your shoot mass um, whether biomass yield production or actual grain yield production is all of a sudden limited almost four or five times lower. So there can indeed be a trade-off. And so what we would really need would be plants that are um, better growers in general. Sometimes it's called plant vigor um, and can maintain a one-to-one, -one, say, ratio of root and shoot mass, which is more or less accurate as a rule of thumb across plants that the mass allocation is about one one to one on average across um, agricultural and wild species. Um, and we think about deep roots, if we want deep roots so that it's down in that soil that maybe has more mineral binding sites <clears throat> and um, is more pr protected, possibly less aerobic, um, so there's less uh, me metabolic activity. So how can we get deep roots? Well, we have to co-optimize architecture and, me and metabolism. And this is um, the area where <clears throat> my, my work has been going, thinking about carbon efficiency. So what do I mean by that? Well, here was, here's our little plant here again. So how can we get deep roots? Let's have the same shoot and the same root mass, but let's just reallocate it. So here's a deep root system, it has no more mass, but it's deeper. And so I've done the, the, the math here that if you multiply 1.5 by 1.5, we'll get 2.5. Two two five, and if you multiply 0. 0.6 by 3.75, you'll get 2.25. So you have deeper roots, the same amount of mass. Um, so you're only affecting the architecture. And I'm going to show you a real life example of this in just a moment. And then the other way is by looking at metabolism and carbon efficiency um, or metabolic burden. And this is an area that I'm really excited about because we've talked a lot about photosynthesis for plants, but we talk less about making them use carbon more efficiently as, for example, with um, reduced plant respiration. But I really believe that this could drive overall plant growth with bigger, bigger plants and deeper roots all, all two together, as you can see here. So I'm going to go into a little bit of these real, real world examples with uh, real, real crops that Roots represent a major component of the plant's carbon economy with a lot of investment in the construction of, of tissue. And one way that we can get deeper roots um, is actually to have fewer axial roots. And I'm gonna show you a real example. Here's a greenhouse experiment with these 1.5 meter tall columns of maize grown for 40 days. In this experiment, the maize plants did, uh, the roots did reach the bottom of these in just 40 days. So the capacity is there to grow deeply. And we wanted to look at um, reduced nodal root number MAs with a manipulative experiment. This is one of the few experiments you'll find where root system architecture is modified directly. Um, and so I think it's a very, it's, it's a convincing study. And so we actually excise the roots as they emerge. These nodal roots and maize emerge over time from the leaf nodes below ground. And we were able to excise those over time to target a 66% reduction in nodal root number and a 33% reduction in nodal root number by cutting these off. You can see these roots here when the plant is older, they're thicker because these roots get thicker as they emerge over time. Um, at the end of the experiment, we washed out the root systems and we can actually separate out the different whorls of roots from the tap root or primary root across these various um, whorls of nodal roots. And you can see that the last roots to emerge, these nodal roots that emerge last, do not go very deep. The deepest root was actually the primary root, which was basically pot bound in the bottom of that 150 centimeter tall pipe. So um, this experiment had high and low nitrogen treatments, and you can see the cutting levels here. So in red, this is uh, zero roots cut away, and in blue, 67% of the roots cut away. 
And you can see many more roots at depth when we cut away two thirds of roots, which I think is a fairly non-intuitive re result that you know basically shows that plant growth is essentially an emergent property as well. And what we see if we look at total root length per plant, again, low nitrogen is in red, zero cut away, and 67% of the roots cut away. What you see is nearly a doubling of total root length. So get that, that we cut away two thirds of the actual roots, but we got nearly double the root length. So how do you explain that? Well, it's all about reallocation within the root system. The root system has an amazing capacity to, um, to have compensatory root growth. And in this case, we have this index that we call lateral, lateral per axial root length, where we can actually separate the lateral roots from their parent roots based on their diameters and then get this ratio. And you can see that when you cut away the roots that this, um, this ratio more than doubles. So what it's saying is that you're dub doubling the, the lateral root length for the same uh, length of their parent roots. And lateral roots are very important for um, the uptake of nitrogen. And in fact, uh, this experiment showed that in the low nitrogen treatment, that plant growth, the shoot mass total was increased by 50% when you cut away two thirds of the roots. And um, the root mass in both these situations was actually not statistically significant different. So the root mass was the same, but it reallocated carbon into cheaper root classes that in fact have a total uh, greater root length so it could explore the soil and gather nitrogen and improve plant growth, the shoot growth overall. And um, we got this data, you can get this type of root length data I wanted to share for people who are interested in roots for soil carbon with our uh, free and open source root image analysis software that's available for free on zenodo.org and that's Rhizovision Explorer. So if you Google that, you can find it and then you can do these type of root studies yourself. Now, along with these construction costs, um, the metabolic activity of the roots is also really important. And these can be measured by root respiration. So you can have plants that respire a little bit of carbon and ones that expire a lot of carbon dioxide. So we wanted to see if we could actually measure this trait as an index of carbon efficiency. So we developed a platform to grow wheat plants and hydroponics. We had a team of people to separate the roots from the shoots and place them in these small tubes here, attach them to these infrared gas analyzers to me measure the carbon dioxide. Um, we get these type of data that we have um, time series data of carbon, um, technically molar fraction increasing over time. We um, share our R code is available on Zenodo as well to process directories of these text files to get the CO2 flux. We divide CO2 flux by length of the root or the volume of the root to get measurements of specific root respiration. And we did this with a diversity panel of wheat so that we could actually calculate the heritability. So there's the heritabilities for specific root respiration is 0.46 and for specific root length, um, a, a, corollary, a, a corollary trait for the construction of the roots is 0.6, actually higher than shoot biomass. These are both very good her, her, heritabilities and apply it's under genetic control. And um, importantly in this graph, you can see a negative relationship of shoot dry mass with specific root respiration by length, which indicates that as we would think, actually um, plants that have less specific root respiration, possibly more efficient roots, um, have less specific root re respiration here actually, have greater shoot dry mass, which may actually go with our hypothesis that this is a trait that could be harnessed for um, metabolic efficiency of the plant um, and related to photosynthesis. Um, because this was a mapping panel, we were able to find uh, gene candidates associated with these uh, specific root respiration traits when the, the dots are genetic regions. When they're above the line, it means it's a St statistically significant relationship of a genetic region with one of these specific root respiration traits. So the potential to breed for these traits is there. And we also found um, these regions for specific root length and other architectural traits. So the potential is there and we have evidence that we can control both um, the architecture and the root activity to get deep, deep deeper roots. And uh, we also know things like exudation are also um, genetically controlled. So when you put all this package together, I believe it is possible 
to target deeper roots, um, different root traits like root hairs and other ones that are um, discussed in the literature to get the carbon there. But then it seems like the big gap is, well, what, what happens to the carbon after that? And are we at risk of actually having a priming effect and releasing carbon to the atmosphere instead? So all in all, what I'm basically talking about is the carbon efficiency of the plant ecosystem. Uh, so we have photosynthesis and allocation to roots, rhizodeposition and soil respiration. Um, I tie all this into the nitrogen cy cycle as well because it can't be really separated. And finally, um, to get to these uh, different types of soil organic matter, whether it's the particulate organic matter or mineral uh, associated, that seems to be more stable. So this is basically where I see my work going now that I'm working at a national lab and the Department of Energy seems to be clear that they're interested in what we can do about climate change. So I want to acknowledge my um, funders and my employers and uh, some of the people that I showed the data from here today. And thank you, Claire, for the opportunity. And I can take a few questions as long as they're not too hard. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Um, I'm going to pass on to you a question from Stephen Hall. So are there trade-offs between genes that regulate specific root respiration with other key traits that influence yield, drought, or flood resistance, et cetera? And I, I guess I'll add on to that, too, with you saw differences in your, with your um, experiment where you were trimming the roots and got differences in rooting depth. What was going on above ground? Did you see differences in 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 plant function? Yeah. So in the first case of the specific root respiration, there's a lot of reasons the respiration could be different, and um, there's there's like a caveat. Say, I mean that clearly uh, respiration is also an indicator of life. So a root with zero respiration is a dead root. So there's somewhere there's a happy spot in the middle of being dead and being an optimal root. And um, I, I, re, I refer to this um, as luxury res respiration, that I believe that there may be some level of respiration that is not needed. And how to tease that, that portion that's not needed out is, is difficult. Um, for example, we know also that respiration is related to nutrient uptake so it will be a lot of work to figure out what portion of the respiration is um, is not needed and but some of some of the gene candidates were related to things like the production of atp which is the energy molecule so they weren't you know not all of them were directly related to um, other types of processes and as far as the root pruning experiment um well the the root pruning itself doesn't seem to have any type of effect directly. And the effects we saw on shoot growth and low nitrogen treatment, and also um, the same trend, but non-significant for the highest cutting level in high nitrogen. So I believe it really was having an effect there, but wasn't measurable in our experiment. Um, that's a compounding effect that the, Pruning the root allowed more carbon to go to lateral roots. Lateral roots allowed more nitrogen to be taken up. More nitrogen allowed more shoot growth, more photosynthesis. More photosynthesis allows more root growth, more nitrogen uptake, more shoot growth, more so photosynthesis. And we have to remember that these things, plant physiology compounds day after day after day. It's not an immediate effect. And it's this compounding that I think is that if we can unlock this, this positive feed, feedback loop, I, I really believe that we can do um, big things for plant production by not only focusing on photosynthesis, we have to think about photosynthesis, plant metabolism, et cetera, to unlock the carbon efficiency of the plant. Thank you. Um, okay, so we learned last month at our last webinar that the effect of tillage remains unresolved as far as whether um, adopting reduced tillage practices increases soil carbon or just there's a redistribution. Um, to what extent can this be resolved by combining the unintuitive root growth in response to cutting 
and the perforation concept. Um, <laughs> I guess there's a lot of ways to interpret that, but um, I, I think where I take that comment is kind of, you've, you've described kind of an experimental context in which we can manipulate roots Mm -hmm. And um, how do you envision using that to possibly answer some of the questions you raised about then how does this affect the soil? Mm -hmm. um, well, what that's experiments a good way would you do next? <laughs> that's a good way to think about it because I do view that method as an experimental system that others could replicate. Um, that I've been a little upset with that paper that nobody nobody has tried to validate this work, and so I would welcome you to see um, what happens when you when you do this. And I do want to be clear that my point with it isn't that I would say that you know we should develop say tractor implements that would prune roots for you. Um, we can we can find the there's genetics behind nodal root number two, and so the point of this experiment was that it it, it didn't rely on different genotypes that have different nodal root number it, it, it was a direct manipulation because different genotypes usually have many things that are different but if you do want to do this type of direct manipulation experiment and um, control for everything in your system except for root depth you know then th this would we, this would be a way to do it i do think that you could actually prune roots in the in the field and get the same re result um, to, to ask some questions about um, the effects of deep rooting in natural soils Great. Thank you all. We have reached the end of our time. I want to thank both Larry and Sharon so much for really stimulating talks today. Thank you everybody for attending and we will post the talks and, um, and we welcome you at the end of November for our final webinar of this season, which will be looking at the impacts of soil amendments and specifically manure <laughs> on soil carbon. So thank you everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Take care.